I think oftentimes we expect people to be a certain way when they don't have the tools to, to, to be the thing that we want them to be, the person we want them to be. I'm Kelly Glass. I'm the editorial director of KindredByParents.com. And I'm so glad you're sharing your story with us for the larger parents audience. So thank you. So let's talk about your book, Pops, Learning to Be a Son and a Father. Now, this book is not so much a memoir as it is an exploration of your challenging parent-child dynamic. Many of us can relate to that, but not enough of us talk about that. Um, what can readers expect from Pops? Different readers will get different things out of it. Um, you know, I, I wrote it during the pandemic. It was cheaper than therapy. Um, the, the process was quite cathartic. Hmm. And it, it started as a sort of a conversation um, I, I had been having with my dad, uh, not to give away too much of the book, but my father was um, technically is uh, an addict um, and, and has been for most of his life. Yeah. And several years ago, um, after an incident, we decided as a family that we would try to, to get him some help. We tried it before. Uh, we failed miserably, in large part because we didn't really know what we were doing. Uh, we just knew we needed some help, and, and we tried to sort of bully him into getting some help. And, and, but the last time we tried, we enlisted a professional who knew what she was doing. Yeah. And, um, and lo and behold, it's, it, it stuck. And my dad has been um, alcohol free now for three years, if not longer, um, which is no small feat considering he had been um, a, a, a functional alcoholic and then a not so functional alcoholic for the better part of, of, uh, of half a century. So part of the book is that. Part of the book is, is a look at addiction and what it does to families and what it did to mine and, and what it did to the dynamic uh, between my myself and, and my father. But, but the other part of the book, it's a look at families and how complicated we are, uh, all of us. Yeah. And some of the things that, uh, that lead to those complications. And, you know, it's, it's funny, Kelly, because I, it's, for me at least, and this is probably true for you too, your parent, before you have your own children, you view your parents one way, at yeah. least for me. Like I, I viewed my parents through a certain lens and then you have your own kids and you you start to to navigate the responsibilities of the world and you start to view your parents differently um and that's what happened to me and i i, I got to a point in my life where uh, my son was getting older we just had our daughter and i was um i was angry at my dad for a long time and then i got to a point where I felt bad for my dad and I felt sorry for my dad. And part of it had to do with the way that we view addiction as a society and the way that we view addiction, it's evolved. And I would contend it's evolved fairly quickly to a certain extent. Um, but I came to see addiction for what it was, a disease, a sickness, not a weakness. And the way that I viewed my dad, it started to change. And um, I'm a firm believer in therapy. And so my therapist and I, we were talking. And at one point, I think she said some years ago, she's like, you know, it's, some people might benefit from that story. And I was like, no, no one will benefit from that story. And I had a publisher approach me a couple of years ago about uh, writing a different kind of book. And I had no interest in that. But I said to him, I said, well, you know, what do you think about this? And I, I sort of shared my family's story and my dad's story. and and how we started this relationship anew later in life. And, and the publisher was like, that's a story. Were you surprised that this story resonates with other people? Were you not surprised? Kelly, I had no idea how many people are either an addict themselves or uh, love someone who's an addict or have lost someone to addiction. I had no idea because we don't talk about it, especially in our community. Like it's not, it's still not something that we, especially when it comes to certain addictions. Um, I feel like we've gotten a little bit better with drug addictions and, and, but alcohol I think is still viewed by and large as a weakness. So we know they just drink too much. You know, they can't get their drinking under control. And, and what a lot of folks don't understand is, you know, 
whether you're a gambling addict, whether you're addicted to internet porn, whether, you, whether you're addicted to shopping or, or drug, whatever, addiction, um, it's a disease. And, and, and I just, the number of people who have come out of the woodworks, I still get people who email or I'll see them out on the plaza at the Today Show or I'll see them in an airport and they'll come up and, and want to talk about it, which is, which is precisely why I wrote the book. Like it's, I didn't, I didn't write the book um, as you know, people don't generally write books to make money. I didn't write the book to make a bunch of money or, um, or raise my name ID or anything like that. I, I wrote the book to help people. Um, but I also wrote it, uh, Kelly, because I, I, wanted, um, I wanted my father to know that all was forgiven hmm. and that he had inspired me in, in ways that he probably didn't fully appreciate. And, and it's, it's kind of ironic now that my dad, uh, who, who is pretty hard on himself still, he is now, through his story, doing so much good. So much good. I've been stunned by the response. For other people out there who are working through healing their childhood trauma, tell us how you reconciled having empathy for your father and this idea of finding forgiveness with also knowing that you had to break the cycle you know, and say, this is not what I'm going to give to my own children. I forgave my father uh, some years ago, not, not so much for him or our family. I had to forgive my father for me because what, what, what had started to happen is I, I just, I was angry. I was annoyed all the time with him and, and with my mother for putting up with him. Like it, I, I, I was annoyed by him directly and indirectly. And our, our relationship was, it was a cold war. Like we, we talked maybe once a month, maybe, maybe. Um, and it, 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 was, it, it wasn't the kind of relationship that I wanted my son to see. I, it, it was important to me that my children came to know my parents came to know their grandfather. Yeah. Um, that was part of my motivation. When you have kids, one of the, one of the chief goals is just to, just to not screw them up. You don't want to put all the baggage that you have on your kids. Mm -hmm. And you don't even, be, at least for me, I didn't realize how much baggage I had until yeah. you start talking about it. And you're like, oh, wow, yeah. I am screwed up in that way. And then, yeah, okay, I know why. And then all of a sudden you find yourself talking to your children or interacting with your children in certain ways. And, and some, of the, some of the ways I found myself interacting with my kids were the same way that my parents were interacting with me mm. that, 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 that weren't always productive. Um, so I had to break that cycle. And, and part of reconciling with my dad, it, it, helped, it helped break the cycle. Um, it really is people sometimes talk about, or people sometimes ask, you know, Craig, what are you, you, know, what are you proudest of? And my children, my, my marriage, um, my, my, my work product, all those things are great. But I am immensely proud of the relationship that I have forged with my father. It is very difficult to um, overstate um, how estranged we had become mm -hmm. and how estranged he had become from the rest of the family. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the fact that we brought him back into the fold and he is the kind of grandfather that I, I wish I'd had as a father. He's making up for lost time in a big way. Lots of people are not as lucky, I would say, to have that sort of reconciliation, honestly. Do you still feel, right? Because we all still have these inner children. Do you still feel any regret or is there any feelings of guilt or shame between you and your father? I, I regret not trying um, more aggressively sooner. I wasn't in a place where I could have probably done it. Right. Um, and he wasn't in a place where he could have received it, quite mm -hmm. frankly. Um, I don't believe in accidents. And so mm -hmm. the timing was, was perfect. But I, I do wish, because, and I write about it in the book, I mean, we had tried a number of interventions over the years. And, and, and those interventions, I think, looking back on them in terms of motivation, they, they, were, they were more for us. It sort mm -hmm. of make us feel good or feel better uh, about our role as sons or even his wife or, or siblings. And 
we were doing it for the wrong reasons. I am blessed and fortunate in so many ways. But if I had grown up like a like a Huxtable kid, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I am. I would not. That's the irony of it. Like That's real. because I spent, you know, the better part of 25, 30 years not pleased with with my family's story. And, and now I realize my my family's story is what what led to all of this. You know, it's cool. It's really, I, I'm thankful that I, 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 I sort of happened upon the awareness. Do you feel like you found freedom in embracing this story? Yes, yeah. a certain kind of freedom. I'm still shackled in other ways, but, uh, but no, with, with regard to that part of my life, yes. And not, just, not even just a freedom, a peace. This is one of my qualms with, with um, our society. I think oftentimes we expect people to be a certain way when they don't have the tools to, to, to be the thing that we want them to be or the person that we want them to be. We want every you know, guy to be a great dad. Well, if you grew up in a house with no father or no father figure or, or dad who was in it, how, how is it reasonable to expect that you can be a great father. Like if you can't see something, it's very hard to be something. Yeah. And, and I didn't, I, when I started writing this book and I, I was talking to my dad early on, that's the best part of writing the book with, with these recorded conversations that I had with my dad. And he started telling me stories about his father. And I was like, well, damn, you, you were exponentially better than that deadbeat. Like, I mean, <laughs> if, if you start to realize. A cycle. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, but it's, but people, and we all do it. We all want, you know, our moms or our dads or siblings, even sometimes we want them to be what we want them to be and how we think they should be. They don't, they, a lot of times, hell, I, I maintain more often than not, they don't possess the requisite tools to do it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an unrealistic expectation. And you just touched on a very important part of the healing process that we do not, we leave that part out, right? Setting healthy expectations for other people. It's not just you, but how yes. you're dynamic with other people. What are your expectations? Are they healthy? What are your boundaries? Are they healthy? Um, so it's so important. Um, how old are your children? Uh, my son is eight. Um, I turned eight in March and my, my daughter is uh, she's five, although I was corrected a couple of days ago. She said she was five and a half. And I was doing that. Right. She is, because her birthday, <laughs> birthday's in November. And I was like, well, it's June, July. I was talking about I was like, well, technically you're right. I guess technically you are five and a half. That makes the uh, half. <laughs> she's every bit of five and a half. When you're eight year old and you're five and a half year old, look back. Um, on their own childhoods when they're adults, what do you hope they see? When they look back on their childhood, um, and my daughter now will say sometimes, like, Daddy, I'm living my best life. <laughs> I'm like, yes, sweetie, you are. You are living your best life. At five and a um, half. <laughs> they are going to look back on a childhood that is, quite frankly, probably a bit too idyllic. Um, they, they don't want for me much um you know they got a pool they have their own rooms they have their own bathrooms they take nice vacations at dinner they don't like what's been prepared uh, me or my wife we get up and we play short order cook and we'll <laughs> pop some chicken nuggets in the oven or make whatever versus when we sure. were growing up like if it was liver and onions that's what you had like you either ate it and complain, or you just didn't eat. No, they're gonna look back on a uh, on a childhood that, that that's not just filled with things. Mm. Um, my children are loved, deeply loved, and they knew that. Um, when I was growing up, we would we would hug on a special occasion. Like it, if it was, you might get a hug at graduation, or you might get a you <laughs> might get a hug if you were going off to college, or uh, at a wedding or a funeral or something. I mean, hugs were not just in abundance. Um, my kids, they wake up to hugs, they go to sleep to hugs and get like, it's just, they're showered with love. We decided early on that was going to be 
our approach to parenting. And I guess we'll find out, you know, in a few years whether it, it pays off. But we want them at least to look back on, on, on their childhood and understand the value of family. We spend a lot of time surrounded by family. I got a cousin coming over um, in just a few minutes who's in college here in, in Connecticut. And she's come over to spend a few days because that's how we grew up. Like we grew up with family was always around. And then you grow up and you realize uh, we've been calling him cousin for years. He's not actually our cousin. <laughs> so, but, but no, it's, it's, um, it's, we're, we're surrounding them with quite, quite the village. And, and for us, it's, it's unique um, because it's, it's a, it's a multiracial village mm -hmm. and it's not even just multiracial, like it's, it's multi-ethnic, it's, mm -hmm. you know, my wife is married to a woman from Ecuador, um, my sister-in-law is Jewish, like they, they get, they get a lot of everything yeah. and, and it, it, it's, it's, it's actually been pretty cool to watch as they grow up. Um, because they embrace it all. In honor of Father's Day and Juneteenth falling on the same day this year, yeah. um, I want to talk about Black father figures, which your book also touches on father figures. Is there any one or more than one who made an impact on your life who you want to kind of shout out? You know what? I, I write about this in the book. Um, and it's important to make the distinction between the two, uh, between Bill Cosby and, mm -hmm. and Dr. Heath, Heathcliff Huxtable. Uh, because I, I grew up with Dr. Huxtable. And, and, you know, Thursday nights, eight o'clock, uh, to be able as a, a eight, nine year old boy, um, watch a show that, that, that didn't just celebrate blackness. This was a celebration of excellence. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the, the dad was there every day. He'd gone to work at the hospital. He comes home and kisses his wife who happened to be a lawyer. The kids weren't in trouble. Um, they celebrated academics, they celebrated culture and music like that. I watched it and I write about it a fair about the book because I watched that and I, I remember thinking, that, I, want, I want my dad to be like that. I want to be like Theo. I want to be like the Huxtables. Yeah, for me, that was, that was the father figure yeah. uh, growing up. And again, the distinction is important. Yep. Um, but uh, Dr. Heathcliff Huxtable. I think if you if you talk to a lot of of, of young black men of a certain age, you you would find that. Like, mm -hmm. if, if you, you know, this is the beauty of television. Even now, I mean, granted, you know, now it's streaming and, and social media. But um, if you if you didn't have an example um, in your immediate vicinity. You could you could find one in other places, mm -hmm. whether it was yeah. movies or television or books, um, and that's what I did. And I think it's, you know, actually, I I, I think it's probably helped me.